Friday, December 17, 2010, 11.30 a.m. For generations before that, the predominantly Muslim Arab countries have been ruled by secular military dictatorships, choking the lives out of the Arabs and giving the chance to the underground Islamic movements like the Muslim Brotherhoods to convince people that everything that they were suffering from is that they did not apply the law of God or, in their mind, the Sharia law as the uh, law of the states. To say that it was a good thing that the predominantly Muslim countries uh, are ruled by secular dictatorships that are not in connection with those people is exactly the same as saying that the 1938 Hitler's Nazi Germany was good because, well, there wasn't any war happening and we did not hear of any Jews being arrested. Of course, both statements are not true. The American army came to Iraq in 2003, and the first of those military dictatorships was toppled. And although the United States did not have any clear post-war plan and did not take the Islamic threat seriously, the presence of the American army there kind of kept the territory in check for the eight years that they stayed there. And then it happened. The change happened, but not in Baghdad, but 2,000 miles to the west of Baghdad. Specifically, with this man, whose name is ironically Muhammad. Muhammad al Azizi, a poor 26 year old street vendor from Tunisia, borrowed $200 to buy produce for his street stand. That was the day before December, 20, uh, December 17. When he was standing in the street, when he bought the produce and he set his uh, uh, street stand, uh, a uh, female municipal officer came to him and told him that he, uh, it was illegal for him to be there because he did not have the uh, vendor's permit that he's required to sell his produce. The argument between them escalated. She cussed him, she slapped him on the face, she turned down his table, and she confiscated his electric scale. The man was a poor man, and everything that started with him, he did not mean to do anything. He was just trying to make a living and support his family. But that man had no hope, and he did not know God. And he did not have Jesus in his life. His life did not have any direction or purpose or hope. He went to the governor's office and he demanded that they would release his uh, electric scale. And he said, if you don't see me, well, the governor refused to see him. Well, the Tunisia ha used to be one of those corrupt uh, uh, secular dictatorships. And the governor refused to see him. And he threatened, if you don't see me, I'll burn myself. And they ignored his threat. He went across the street and bought a gallon of gas and set himself on fire right in front of the TV. And that brought panic to the whole Arab world. Somebody actually panicked so much that he threw water on him, making his condition even worse. The man was taken to the hospital. He did not die immediately. 90% uh, of his body was filled with burns. Ironically, just to add one final act of corruption, the Tunisian president uh, promised that he would be transferred into France to be treated. He was never transferred into France, and he died on that very day. And that started the unstoppable. A public demonstration against the corrupt government of Tunisia happened that eventually changed the government in Tunisia for the first time and replaced the secular government with a pro-Muslim government. And that started what we know today as the Arab Spring that started to spread like a wildfire throughout the other Arab countries, Algeria, then Egypt, then Yemen, then Libya, then Syria, and we are still suffering from those 
uh, 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 things, the, the consequences of the Arab Spring that started when this man set himself on fire. Last week, we studied how sin gave birth to Islam and how the lack of faith prepared Arabia in the 7th century to receive that kind of faith that spread like a wildfire right after the death of Muhammad, just like the Arab Spring. In today's class, we will learn the story of Muhammad and the early history of Muslims and how one man happened to be at the right time, at the right place, to claim to be the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. But first, let's have a view on the basic faiths and practices of Islam, the basic doctrines, and what Islam really is. With over one and a half billion Muslims around the world, Islam is over 22% of the world's population. It is the second, now look here, this is a secular statistic. This is counting everyone in the Christendom, in the Christian world as Christian. It is the second largest religion in the world, but really, if you consider only the real Christians versus the real Muslims, Islam is the largest religion in the world. It is the fastest growing religion in the world. 21 of the 22 Arab countries are Muslim. Not all Arabs are Muslims. I am an Arab man, but I am not a Muslim. Not anymore, that is. Uh, neither all uh, uh, Muslims are Arabs. In fact, the largest Muslim country is not an Arab country, and that would be Indonesia. As you can see in the map, 21 of the 22 Arab countries, the ones in green, are Muslims, and the only country that claims to be a Christian is the new country of South Sudan a country that was born only five years ago. Uh, so you can safely say that Islam covers one-fifth of the globe. Uh, 50 out of the 258 countries of the world are Muslims. And as you can see, they are almost in one block that almost used to be the Islamic empire, as we will see in a few minutes. The word Islam means submission. Islam does not mean peace. The, word, the words Islam... Uh, and, and, and salam, which is the Arabic word for peace, they sound like each other, but etymologically, they don't have anything to do with each other. Islam literally means submission. Islam is the religion. A Muslim is a follower of that religion, just like Christianity and Christian. So Muslim literally means submissive. Uh, Allah means God. Of course, technically, whenever we talk about Allah, we mean the Quranic God, as opposed to the biblical God. But Allah is just an Arabic word that means God. The source of the Islamic faith is the Muslim scripture that is called the Quran. The Quran is probably three times bigger than the New Testament. Most Muslims, uh, oh, okay, take this back. All Muslims memorize at least a part of the Quran. And many Muslims actually memorize the whole Quran. That Quran is divided into 114 chapters. The Hadith is the second source of the Islamic faith and law. The Quran is the primary source and the Hadith is the secondary source. The Quran is believed by Muslims to be the direct word of God, while the Hadith is believed by Muslims to be the direct words of Muhammad. And there isn't any one book that you can download from the internet or that you can buy from any bookstore that has all the hadiths. In fact, the Quran is believed by all Muslims, but different Muslims have different groups of hadiths, different volumes, kind of like the Jewish Talmud. Uh, the word Sharia literally means law. It is used, uh, and, and uh, when you say law, the, the Arabic word for law, Sharia, you usually refer to the law of Islam. Uh, and once again, some words are just words, but that they are used in different contexts to mean different things. Uh, for example, from the Arabic Bible, the, right, the Arabic writing on the left is the Bible. This is not the Quran. And it literally says in the first uh, part, in the first passage, in the beginning, Allah created the heaven and the earth. Why? Well, because Allah is the Arabic word for God. Uh, the second uh, uh, passage we read that God invited Moses to come to the top of the mountain that he may give him the Sharia. 
God, of course, gave the law of Moses and not the law of Islam to Moses, but the word that is used is Sharia. Uh, uh, in fact, Ephesians 5, 2 says that, well, we know that Christ submitted himself for us out of his love to us. The word for submitted is the same word that means Muslim. And that passage literally in Arabic says that Christ became a Muslim. Not Muslim in the religious text, context that we know of, but he just submitted himself for us. Paul told Timothy to fight the good, quote, jihad, end quote. Jihad is an Arabic word that means fight. Fight the good fight. So uh, those words can be used technically to mean specific elements of the Islamic faith, or they can be used generically to, uh, b b to mean anything else in the Christian faith or any other faith. A Muslim must do five things called the five pillars of the Islamic faith. A Muslim must confess that there is only one God and that Muhammad is his prophet. By the way, there was a controversial issue in the news a few months ago over a teacher uh, in a school, I think, in the one of the uh, northeastern states that was teaching uh, his uh, students the religions of the world. And he taught them that in order for people to become Muslims, they must recite the confession or the shahada. And many people were upset that that man actually converted those children to Islam. He did not do that. He was just a teacher that was teaching different religions. You cannot convert to Islam only by reciting the Shahada. You will have to have the intention to do that, and you will have to have witnesses to witness that you are saying that in order for you to, be, to become a Muslim. A Muslim must pray five times a day. Not the prayer that we know of, not just the communication with God. There are two Arabic words for prayer. There is the Salat, and, of course, you have seen Muslims on TV or on movie, and they make a series of movements. They stand, and they kneel, and they prostrate, and they sit, and they recite certain passages from the Quran, and they repeat that five times a day. You don't miss one of them, or you are condemned to eternal destruction. A Muslim must give alms. Most uh, people in the Muslim world are Sunnis. 85% of Muslims are Sunnis, and they believe that you have to give 2.5% of your fixed rate, not your increase, every year to a mosque to spread the cause of Islam. Put that in mind whenever anyone uh, invites you to uh, put something in the collection plate and see how are you going to fight or how, uh, how are you going to counter the spread of Islam and how many millions of dollars they are spending to to spread the Islamic faith and to print publications and to distribute them and to put those signs that invite you to a Quran study or to buy whole departments in universities. A Muslim must fast in Ramadan. Ramadan is a month in the lunar calendar of Islam called the Hijri calendar. It, of course, comes once every year and you have to fast for 30 days or 29 days depending on that year. Uh, you do not eat, drink or have sex for the whole hours of the day. Uh, that can be 14 or 15 or 10 hours, depending on the season and what part of the globe. And a Muslim must do the Hajj pilgrimage, go to Saudi Arabia and do the rituals around what is known as the Kaaba, the holiest site in Islam, and we will see it in a few minutes. Now here's the thing. We talked about the fact that Islam does not answer the question, what must I do to be saved? Many people who would talk to people who are ignorant about Islam, they would tell them, if you just confess that there is only one God, then you have become Muslims. That's not true. You have to confess that Muhammad is his prophet and his final prophet. Am I a perfect Muslim now? No. You will have to do those five pillars of the Islamic faith. Am I a perfect, saved Muslim now? No. In fact, the Quran does not even have the word salvation. It does not even have the word assurance. You will be on your way to, to, to observe countless uh, ordinances of the Islamic Sharia law, and you will never be considered a true Muslim. That's why Muslims are fighting each other, because each Muslim has a different definition of, a word, uh, of the word Muslim. A Muslim does five things. A Muslim must believe in six things. You know that in Christianity, you have to believe first before you obey the gospel. In Islam, you have to convert to Islam first, and then you can believe. And that's why it's common 
uh, at least it used to be common at a certain time to spread Islam by force. And once you become a Muslim, you cannot convert back from Islam uh, with your head over your shoulder. Uh, so a Muslim believe in six things. If you are a Muslim, you must believe in God. You must believe in the scriptures, including the Bible. The, uh, the word Bible does not have any uh, uh, technical word in Arabic. They divide the Bible into Zabur Dawood or the Psalms of David, Taurat Musa or the Torah or probably the whole Old Testament, Injil Isa, that would be the Gospel of Jesus, and the Quran. Many people have asked me, uh, I have a Muslim friend, how can I start a spiritual conversation with my Muslim friend? And my answer is usually, you don't. They usually will start that conversation. Because Muslims have a zeal for God, but as Paul said, that zeal is not based on knowledge. They love God. They love to talk about prophets and about the scriptures and about the accounts of the Bible, the creation and Adam and Eve and, and the flood of Noah, but they don't have... Uh, uh, the knowledge of the true God and the true will of God. You must believe in the messengers, the prophets, including Jesus as a prophet and Moses and all those other prophets. They believe in the last day and they believe in predestination, good and evil. So back to our story of the, uh, the, uh, the life of Muhammad and the spread of Islam. Muhammad is technically the creator of Islam, uh, uh, even the, the time when, when the Britain used to be the big elephant in the room when they used to invade countries, and uh, they, uh, the, the terminology that the British made was the, the, the adopted terminology. They used to call Muslims Mohammedians. That is a politically incorrect word. That would offend Muslims because they uh, would think, well, we are not followers of, the, of a cult that was established by Muhammad. We just submit to God, and that's the name of the religion that we follow according to the Quran. Uh, once again, we studied last week that Muhammad did not start anything. Dictatorships are not started by one dictator. There has to be a public sympathy toward the cause of that dictator and for all those people to join and to follow that uh, founder of a faith or a political movement uh, or anything. And that was exactly what happened with Muhammad. He happened to be at the right time, at the right place, to claim to be a prophet. Uh, this is Arabia in the year 570 AD. That would be all over five centuries after the ascension of Jesus Christ. We learned about those Judaizers, the Jewish Christian heresies, that started because of the people's lack of faith in Paul's apostleship. They had a perverted gospel. They believed in Jesus as the Messiah, but not the Son of God. Uh, they, they, they focused on, they emphasized on keeping the law of Moses. The Romans invaded the Holy Land in AD 70 to quench the rebellion that actually started because of the beginning of Christianity. And they persecuted Jews, Christians, and those followers of those heresies, the Essenes, the, uh, uh, and, and, and other groups in, in uh, the, the, the first century. Those people escaped. The Jews resisted, and they were destroyed. The temple was destroyed, and the uh, last of the Jewish rebels uh, hid in the uh, Hadassah stronghold and then later on they had a suicide pact where they had to kill each other but the christians escaped because they obeyed what jesus told them when he told them when you see this th these things coming uh, if, if you are in judea escape to the mountains and do not go back home to take anything so they escaped persecution those jewish christian heresies also escaped the persecution to the neighboring area including arabia and by the time muhammad was born arabia was filled with those heresies, and they had apocryphal scriptures that we do not know anything now about. The Gospel of Thomas, we never heard that. The church did not recognize that uh, gospel or that scripture as an inspired scripture. But anyway, uh, Arabia, that white space known today as Saudi Arabia, after the family that rules that country, the family of Al Saud, was the white space between the Roman and the Persian Empire. 
Arabs were already a big community, but they did not have any state of their own. They were, they had a lot of values. Arabs are known for their generosity, their boldness, and, and they are good fighters. They are good poets. They had a lot of things, but they were uh, probably confederacies of tribes that are fighting and invading each other. And they felt the humiliation of not having an identity standing between the two superpowers of the ancient world. They were thirsty for something to unite them. They were thirsty for an identity. They were looking for themselves and somebody else, just as we see in some of the political rallies now in the presidential campaign, when people are punching each other on the face over a political candidate. Why would you punch somebody on the face if you're not completely stripped out of your identity and you're looking for yourself and somebody else? That was the atmosphere in Arabia when uh, Muhammad was born. Keep in mind, Arabs were predominantly pagan, but they knew God and they fear God. This is what we call syncretism. When you worship God, but you compromise the faith of God with other religions. That concept is mentioned in the Bible. The Samaritans did that. We read about them in 2 Kings 17:33. We read that they feared the Lord, yet served their own gods. Arabs were worshiping idols, but they also worshiped God. They knew God. They knew the biblical accounts, although they did not have an Arabic translation of the Bible. They just heard about God from those Jewish Christian heresies. It was then when Muhammad was born, when the prophecy of Genesis 16, verses 11 and 2, was being fulfilled. Behold, says the angel of the Lord to Hagar when she was pregnant with Ishmael, you are with child, and you shall deliver a boy, and his name shall be Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man, his man against every uh, uh, body and everybody's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the midst of his brethren. Arabs and Jews live next to each other. Muhammad is the direct descendant of Ishmael, as you can see. And by the way, yours truly is a direct descendant of Muhammad. Muhammad was born in the year 570 AD. His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six. His uncle, his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, raised him up, and then his uncle, uh, Abu Talib. He worked in his youth as a shepherd. Then he became a merchant. He started to travel a lot, and that gave him a rich exposure to the Jewish Christian accounts and faith and beliefs. At the age of 25, a woman by the name Khadija, she was 40 back then, she invested her money in his, in his trade and he made a decent profit and she liked his character so much, she actually proposed to him. Muhammad continued to be married to this woman alone until she died. Because, well, at the beginning, Muhammad was a follower of those Jewish Christian heresies. He did believe in the sanctity of marriage, one man, one woman. And it wasn't until she died and Islam evolved into a separate religion that he started to have multiple wives at the same time. Khadija is related to a priest of one of those Jewish Christian heresies called the Abunite Church. And the name of that priest was Waraka bin Nofal. He is the one who sanctioned the prophethood of Muhammad. By the way, everything that you see now is common knowledge. Not a single Muslim would be offended by that, and uh, nothing is being made up if it's not uh, approved by and agreed upon by both Muslims and non-Muslims. The revelation at the age of 40, as Muhammad was hanging out with those followers of those uh, Judaizing heresies, one of their practices was to go to the wilderness and meditate in caves. And he used to go to a cave in that mountain two miles away from Mecca, which is called Mount Hira. And he used to meditate uh, with the, uh, some, uh, and most of the times he used to meditate alone until that day, August 10, 610 AD. He claimed that he received a revelation from God through Gabriel, 
the angel that appeared to Mary and told her about the, the pregnancy. And these uh, verses, Muhammad claimed that he received from God, and they would be the first verses of what we know today as the Quran. Once again, the lack of faith in the sufficiency of the scripture actually made people believe that somebody is being receiving revelations from God. And they were so happy that an Arab man was receiving verses from God. No longer do we have to go to the Jews and beg them to, uh, to, to teach us what their own scripture says or to go to those Christians who do not read their Bible in uh, Arabic. Muhammad claimed to have received those verses. The early passages of the Quran did not have any specific religion in them. Muhammad did not intend at that time to start a new religion. He just wanted people to submit to God the way Jews and Christians submit to God and to forsake idols. By the way, once again, the current Quran that we have is not arranged in a chronological order. So these five verses, they should be in Surah or chapter number one. But actually in the standard Quran, they are in chapter 96. Because, well, the Quran is not arranged in a chronological order. Muhammad continued to claim to receive those revelations for the rest of his life, 22 years. The Quran was not written down in his time. It was written down under the third successor of Muhammad, or Caliph. Have you heard of the word Caliph, like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, he's a Caliph. A Caliph is an Arabic word that literally means a successor, somebody who succeeds Muhammad. The Quran was written down and compiled and standardized under the third successor, of Muhammad. Khadija, his wife, was the first person who believed in his message. She believed that he was the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. She believed that he is actually receiving revelations from God. And Waraka bin Nawfal, the Ebunite priest who joined them in marriage, he said, truly, this is the law, the great law that came upon Moses. Uh, those heresies did not believe in the end of the Jewish age. Remember Jacob's prophecy when he said that the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of all people, uh, signifying the end of the Jewish age and the coming of the Messiah. Well, the Messiah came, but people still believe that you have to observe the law of Moses. You have to rebuild the temple and offer animal sacrifices. Arabs believe that. In fact, the first holy place in the, Arab, the, the Muslim world was the temple of Jerusalem. Muslims used to pray toward the temple of Jerusalem until a Quranic verse came and he said, no, we are not good with Jews, we are not cool with Jews anymore. Switch the direction from the temple to the Kaaba, the building that we will see in a few minutes. Uh, then Ali, his cousin, then Zaid, his foster son. By the way, adoption in, is banned in Islam. Why? Because later on, Muhammad took his foster son's wife from him and married her. That would be considered incest, right? Not unless adoption is banned in Islam. And adoption is still forbidden in Islam. Muhammad claimed or proclaimed his message in secret for three years. Then he turned public. The first uh, proclamation of Islam, Muhammad called Muslims uh, or, or everybody uh, to believe in one God, to do good, to give money to the poor, to believe in the resurrection and that there will be a heaven and hell. He did not really introduce any new law. He did not introduce any new religion, as we will see in the chart that will come up in a few minutes. Within almost 10 years, hundreds of people converted to Islam. Uh, uh, the, the, that that uh, scene that I told you about, when people were looking for an identity, they were looking for an Arab uh, leader, uh, uh, and, and, and they were humiliated by, by not having a cultural identity uh, being between the two superpowers of that time. They found themselves in Muhammad and they followed him in a massive scale. Uh, whole tribes proclaimed loyalty to Muhammad. Opposition in Mecca, that's the city in which Muhammad was born, started when Muhammad delivered verses that condemned idol worship. The main message of Islam is monotheism, the belief in one God. Well, Mecca had a lot of idols. They were making money out of those idols. Remember when Paul went to Ephesus in uh, Acts uh, 19, 
uh, the main reason why he was persecuted because he was calling for one God while people were making statues of Diana or, or Artemis. And uh, that, of course, threatened their business. This is exactly why the early Muslims were persecuted. The study of the Muslim persecution is very important because that's the reason why Muslims are so defensive and that's why they get so offended so fast. They would be persecuted so severely that they will have bitterness toward the rest of the world for the rest of the Islamic history. Uh, so, Muhammad's denunciation of the Meccan traditional religion was especially offensive to his own tribe, Quraysh. And Quraysh, Muhammad's tribe, used to be the guardians of the Kaaba. The Kaaba, the holy site of Islam, used to have 360 idols. They were making money out of the people that uh, came to visit and to worship those idols. What are you saying? Are you saying that we should give uh, away this business because of the faith that you claim to have? This is the Kaaba. Of course, you see this place at least once a year because that's the Hajj season or the pilgrimage season, which is in the 12th month of the Islamic calendar. And... Uh, Saudi Arabia, the government of Saudi Arabia, allows one per thousand of all the world to go there. So, how many people do we have on the globe today? Seven billion people. They allow seven million to visit that place at the same time. And a lot of security precautions are being put because people, usually, in every year there is an accident. People trample each other and there is a virus of some kind that would be concerning. Anyway, that's uh, the reason why you hear about that in the news all the time. Okay. Muhammad and his followers were persecuted by the pagans. Sumayya, a maid servant of a prominent Meccan leader, was stabbed by her own master, and she would be the first one who dies because of Islam. A lot of people had to die before Muhammad. That kind of tells you the difference between Islam and Christianity. When Jesus was the first person who ever died for the Christian faith. But a lot of people had to die for the cause of Muhammad. Muslims started to flee. Some of them went to the Christian Ethiopia. They were received there. Muhammad himself went to another city in Saudi Arabia called Atta'if, but he came back shortly after they stoned him, almost to death. Uh, clans started to uh, 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 declare a public boycott against the early Muslims, the, 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 the seventh century's version of the sanctions, the political sanctions, to try to pressure the Arabs uh, and Muhammad into withdrawing from this new faith. Things started to get from bad to worse in Muhammad's life. And in that year, known in the Islamic history as the year of sorrow, 619, both his wife and his uncle, the two people that sheltered and, and supported him in his message, died at the same time. However, a delegate from another city in Saudi Arabia called Medina, came to Muhammad after they saw in him a brave and wise leader of the Muslim community. And they invited him not only to provide him with a shelter in Medina, but to make him the ruler of that city. At the age of 53, Muhammad arrived in Medina. That's what starts the Islamic calendar, the Hijri calendar. If you ever have an almanac that you can see, and you can see what day is, uh, it is in the, in, in the Gregorian calendar, uh, or the Chinese calendar, there usually is the Islamic Hijri calendar, which is a lunar calendar. I think it's the year 1438, something like that, in the Hijri calendar. That calendar started when Muhammad arrived at Medina. That was a major turning point in the history of Islam because that was the time when Muslims and Muhammad started to turn from passive to active, from being on the defense to being on the offense, from promoting peace and tolerance to other faiths to being the only exclusive faith, preaching violence and destruction against anyone who does not convert to Muhammad's Islam. This map shows us the route of the uh, migration, the Hijra, from Mecca to Medina. Ironically, the Quranic Hijra is parallel to the Red Sea. The biblical Exodus is across the Red Sea. One of them has God's autograph on it, but not the other. This shows this line is the migration, the Hijra. 
This is the beginning of Muhammad's mission as a prophet, and this is his death. When Muhammad started delivering the first verses of the surah that became known as Surah 96, also, although it's the first surah chronologically, Islam was not really a religion. Muhammad just called people to submit to God. It was supposed to be uh, Judaism, or the biblical way, translated into Arabic. Later on, Muhammad introduced Islam as a separate religion when he uh, boldly introduced a new kosher law that is different than the Jewish kosher law. And this law, of course, is called the halal law. And that was around 621, that was before the Hijra. But Islam continued back then to be tolerant to other religions. Some Muslims, uh, some of your Muslim friends would tell you that, well, God is okay with having multiple religions. Uh, I mean, Muslims, Jews, Christians, if you really follow God, then you're okay, you will go to heaven. There are actually some Quran passages that talk about the Islamic tolerance, but these passages do not apply anymore, according to the Muslim doctrine of abrogation. Later on, after the Hijra, Muhammad presented or introduced Islam as the only way to God, and he started promoting violence against anyone who does not convert to Islam. The peaceful, tolerant passages of the pre-Hijra has been abrogated by the violent passages of the post-Hijra. Uh, and although uh, Muslims claim that the Quran is eternal and it has always been with God, uh, the later passages of the Quran are more contemporary and lo local. And they talk about the life of Muhammad and the events between him and, and, and the people uh, around him and the wars and the battles that Muhammad uh, uh, had. After that, of course, the Quran was shuffled as you would shuffle a pack of playing cards. In March 624, as the first act of vengeance against those who persecuted them. 313 Muslim fighters went to loot a merchant's caravan that was coming out of Mecca. The first battle in Islam was fought to loot a civil caravan. The pagan Arabs who owned the caravan sent a thousand fighters to fight those 313 Muslims. Muslims won. Muslims are good fighters, and they won that first battle in the Islamic history that was the Battle of Badr. Muslims still commemorate this battle today, and they still believe that they were few people, and they won over three times uh, their own fighters, and that cannot be from anywhere except God. And that's why Muslims have that boldness whenever they, 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 they fight. Muslims won all the next campaigns. In fact, in the year 630, Muhammad marched back to Mecca, the city that he escaped from, with great power, probably 10,000 Muslim fighters, only the men who are fighters. And he took control of the city, and he purged the Kaaba from the idols. And since that time until now, the Kaaba is considered by Muslims to be the holiest place. Every Muslim uh, bows down to Mecca five times a day. At the age of 63, Muhammad died and was buried in the first mosque that was ever built in Islam in Medina. That is called Al-Masjid al-Nabawi, or the Mosque of the Prophet. This is where Muhammad is buried today. Before his death, Muhammad conquered and united all Arabia. Remember that white space between the Roman and the Persian Empire that did not have any country? Within only a decade, it became one country with one leadership, with one army, and they were so full of determination. Muslims conquered Iraq in 636. By the way, you know by now that the, uh, the Iraqi natives are the Chaldeans and the Assyrians. They are not the Arabs. Uh, I am not a native Iraqi. I have only been in Iraq for 1,400 years. We took uh, their country from them. And Iraq was the first country that was invaded by the Arab Muslims. Uh, and, and they destroy, eventually destroyed the Persian army in 642. Then they took Jerusalem in 638. Then Egypt in 639. Man, look how fast they are going. As fast as the Arab Spring a few days ago. Then they expanded all the way to China and the east. 
and France and the West before their advance in Europe was stopped by the Franks led by Charles Martel, who is the grandfather of Charlemagne, the first Holy Roman Emperor in the Battle of Tours in October of 732. Imagine, without that battle, you will all be Muslims. This is the Islamic State around the year 750, almost a century after Muhammad's death. Islam spread all the way from China and the East to uh, France in the West. The corruption and some internal uh, problems and the Sunni-Shiite division was the main reason uh, why the Islamic State became weak and eventually fell with the fall of Baghdad to the Mongols in the year 1258. Uh, the Islamic State was revived not by the Arabs, but by the Turkish Ottomans in the 1500s. They also established another expanding Islamic State, and that also ended by the end of World War I. And now the Islamic State wants to be revived by people like ISIS, Hamas, uh, the Ayatollahs in Iran, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. They want to revive the Islamic State in obedience to what the Quran tells Muslims to fight until the whole world converts to Islam. We have studied today how in one generation Islam started and spread like a wildfire. You can put the two maps of the spread of Islam and the spread of Christianity next to each, next to each other. Uh, the spread of Christianity is, of course, at the end of your Bible, Paul's missionary journeys, and how Christianity spread. What caused Christianity to spread? Jesus Christ told his apostles in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Christianity spread like a wildfire to cover the Mediterranean world within one generation by the power of the Holy Spirit. Islam also started very quick and spread very fast, not by the power of the Holy Spirit, but by the military leaders who sat at the feet of Muhammad. Coming up next, for we do not wrestle how to preach the gospel to Muslims two weeks from now. Brother Mike.